Well, welcome back to Slapton. We are at uh, the Slapton Lay viewing point at the moment, which is at the other end of the lake. Just take you inside for a quick look, and then we'll go and have a look at a Sherman tank. Yes, you heard that correctly. I'll explain more in a bit. So come with me, let's have a look. This is a great um, bird hide here. Window's a little bit dirty, obviously, because of the, the wind that flies up. We'll go for a walk further on round later on. I've actually just come here today to find out that uh, the weather is going to be closing in over uh, the next day, so I thought I'd come down this afternoon and get to some filming in now before it uh, really closes in. And. Uh, Last time we were at Slapton, we were right at the far end, down the other end of the lake over there. And we've come down to the tall cross end. Uh, the actual uh, fact the buildings that you can see on the other side of the lake, they are actually in Tall Cross Village. Which is what we're up the uh, edge of at the moment. Now if you do come here, just to let you know, they have got a audio talk points, which you can download using your uh, phone and there's some various uh, QR barcodes which you can, uh, well, it gives you little snippets of information around uh, around the lay here. Um, this is an interesting one here is that it uh, explains some of the uh, most common uh, birds that you can see. I did actually just spot a couple of uh, great crested grebes so it is a good uh, place to, to look out for them and also uh, reed, reed warblers. And here is the Sherman tank that was found on the bottom of the seabed here, thanks to the uh, tireless work of a local historian called Ken Small. It was uh, brought back up from the seabed and placed at its location as a memorial to the American servicemen that lost their lives here. And I'll explain more about why and what happened um, shortly. Okay, here we are actually on Slapton Sands Beach. And uh, say so that the first part of the vlog we were at uh, the other end, Slapton Ember, though I didn't actually show the beach at this time, so this is the first time you will have seen the, uh, unless you've been here yourselves of course, Slapton Sands in all its uh, three mile glory for uh, shingle from end to end from here to across to Street Gate at the other end. Now this is uh, Tall Cross uh, Village, the front that faces the sea. You probably notice that uh, a lot of the properties are boarded up. Um, this is to protect them through storm. Uh, we've actually got a storm coming in tomorrow and unfortunately the, a lot of these properties take a, a lot of uh, hammering. I'm actually holding this on uh, my handheld uh, tripod at the moment and even uh, before the storm's coming in it's actually getting quite difficult to hold the camera against the force of the wind and it hasn't even begun yet so it's going to be interesting later on. <laughs> I won't be filming then I can assure you. Uh, yeah, so the, these properties actually um, take the full front of a blast because of the shingle, the, you know, the wind picks the shingle up and it literally smashes the, into the windows when that's why a lot have got uh, shutters up that you'll see. We head our way up to the top of the cliffs there for the old Second World War defence as well as talk to you more about Exercise Tiger. More remains of the uh, Second World War defences here. There's actually one you can go inside when we explore bee sands in a few weeks' time. The reason I brought you up here is uh, this gives you the best geographical perspective of both the beach and the freshwater lake that is uh, slapped and lay, because you can see both to their full effect from this position. Now at this point the, uh, the coastal path 
has actually been closed because of uh, coastal erosion. There is a gate, both the top and the bottom of it. <clears throat> prevents any further access at this point. Uh, sorry for the uh, noise in the background. It's actually the sixth jet aircraft uh, which has flown over here. I think I can hear a seventh in the background in as many minutes. Um, quite extraordinary whether we're on a diversionary flight today here at Tor Cross on Arch Shore. Don't recall the Nismarie planes coming over when I've been here previously. What we're actually looking at now is B Sands. B Sands has its own little lay, which we'll explore in more detail in the next few weeks. Uh, it's just over to the right there in the little valley. And you can also see it's quite an extensive beach. I think the crane you can see at the end of the beach, they're just doing some um, sea defensive works to protect the village. Again, like Tor Cross, it's also quite a vulnerable village uh, to the elements. So they're just uh, shoring that up. Um, and obviously in yeah, the next few hours, we've got quite a terrific storm coming. So uh, not sure if that's gonna be done in time, but hopefully everything will be okay. So just give a sweet round. That uh, there at the end is Star Point Lighthouse. And again, that's another location I hope to uh, cover for you. And uh, moving around, obviously we're looking out at the cross of the English Channel. This point here. And then that's looking across back towards Dartmouth with its own Mewstone. There is in fact another Mewstone near Wembray, the, uh, the other edge of the, on the uh, western side of the South Hams, but uh, the site here has its own. And again, we'll be looking more over that way soon when we explore Little Dartmouth curious hole in the stone there, not quite sure why that is like that. Anybody have any ideas? Drop a note in the comments below. Now Exercise Tiger was one of a series of preparations for the D-Day landings and the exercise itself took place in April of, 19, of 1944 here in South Devon on Slapton Sands. Just to give you uh, a little bit of background, the American troops had uh, arrived at various locations across the South Devon coast and to prepare for their exercise, a number of Southam villages had to be completely evacuated. These included Tor Cross, Stokingham, Chillington, Street and Slapton. In actual fact, the Queen's Arms, the, one of the two pubs in the village. We saw the, the uh, tower in, obviously both of them are closed at the moment, but uh, the Queen's Arms has a number of uh, memorabilia about the evacuation of the time of the village, uh, but obviously I can't share that at the moment because we're still in lockdown and we can't get access to that. Uh, so perhaps it's something we could revisit uh, on a future vlog. So yes, you can picture that uh, all of the local population had been completely evacuated, so there was no local people that uh, witnessed any of the events that I'm, I'm about to describe to you and uh, it's only from later military records uh, that uh, a, a lot of this history uncovered and it, it was a lot of it was to do with the efforts of a uh, as I say a local historian called Ken Small who found some uh, bits and pieces on the bottom of the seabed hereabouts and uh, this was in the 1970s uncovered exactly what happened because it wasn't exactly uh, widespread information as to, to what happened here with the, with the terrible tragedy and loss of life of, of American troops. In late 1943 the British government in conjunction with the Americans uh, decided that a number of practice grounds needed to be set up to practice the uh, what was then top secret uh, uh, Normandy landings and uh, it was decided to utilize uh, the I believe it's called the U group and uh, they chose Slapton Sands here because the terrain and the shingle beach was uh, very very similar to what uh, the troops would actually be landing on uh, when the D-Day invasion took place. Another thing to say about the evacuation is that uh, a lot of the local residents that were evacuated had never actually left their homes at all before being uh, moved away from the villages. Uh, this is obviously to do with the fact that they would have been working on local farms or perhaps fishing and obviously people didn't travel like they do today and so it was a, must have been a massive upheaval uh, to uh, 
to to have been evacuated and in terms of the uh, the, the emotional roar that must have uh, felt for the uh, for the English residents here now landing exercises started to take place towards the end of 1943 and uh, the exercise tiger was was the largest of, of the sequence of the exercises and it took place between April and May of 1944 and it was to, in fact it was actually due to last on the 22nd of April to the 23rd sorry the 30th of April so a week a, a week's entire event and it covered all aspects of the invasion commemorating on on the beach here at landing at Slapton Sands on board nine large tank landing ships, they're called LSTs, the 30,000 troops, yeah, 30,000, imagine that, prepared for their mock landing, which also included a live firing exercise. Now, protection for this came from the British Navy, the Royal Navy, so they would have had ships just behind me, and I do apologise for the uh, sloping uh, uh, horizon uh, on the camera at the moment, that's because uh, the camera's actually, I've put it into the, the beach itself to, to get an aspect, this is, so it's, it's sheltered from the wind here. It's actually sat on a location which is uh, used to be part of the road which washed away a few years ago. Uh, the road's now a bit further inland, but uh, I hope it gives it some protection from, uh, from wind noise uh, from, from the beach. Uh, so they were patrolling, the British Navy were out, out patrolling out, out here at sea, beh behind me. Uh, there was two destroyers and three uh, uh, motorboat torpedo boats were used to, to, to protect the troops during this fight. And they were also protecting right out over towards Lime Bay, towards uh, the Dorset end of uh, Devon. The first phase of the exercise focused on marshalling all the troops into which, which sectors they need to be in and embarkation drills. So you can imagine that uh, the uh, troop carrying uh, would, would come up onto the beach here and you've probably seen it from Second World War clips where the, uh, the door would flip down onto the shingle beach here and they would then exercise with the troops coming out and making their way up towards the beach. In actual fact, this location is very similar to one of the Normandy beaches because that also had a large freshwater lake behind it. So this is why, again, this, this was such a unique location uh, to do the, the practicing exercises. There was the first part of the tragedy. So there's actually two parts to, to what went wrong with Exercise Tiger here. And this is why it's such a, a double tragedy. And the first part is that there was a friendly fire incident. Um, a terrible misnomer of a term friendly fire. There's nothing remotely friendly about it. And it was to do with the way there was a lack of communication in terms of the coordination between the troops. Um, obviously this is in the days before the communication, not like it is now. And, and because of the remoteness of the location and uh, also the, um, the radio frequencies they were using, there was a lot of mis miscommunication. So on the morning of the 27th of April, uh, there was a marked friendly fire incident. H hour was set for 0730 hours and was to include live ammunition to acclimatise the troops to the sights and sounds of a real battle situation uh, for D-Day landings. Uh, during the landing itself, live rounds were to be fired over the heads of the incoming troops by forces on land for the same reason. This followed an order made by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, who felt that the men must be hardened, battle hardened, uh, ready in readiness by exposure to these conditions, ready for the actual D-Day landings themselves. The next exercise, the exercise was to include naval bombardment by ships of Force U bombardment group 50 minutes prior to the landing taking place. So you can imagine this firing going out at sea. There's firing out going out to the sides and the troops are in their landing craft ready to land onto the shingle beach here. Several of the landing craft were actually delayed that particular morning and the officer in charge, American Admiral Don P. Moon, decided to delay H hour for some 60 minutes until half past eight in the morning. Some of the landing craft did not receive word of the charge. This is part of the problem, again, the, the, the communication issue with it. Landing on the beach on their original scheduled time, the second wave come under fire, suffering an unknown number of casualties. Rumours circulated around the remaining troops that as many as 450 
men, that's own men from the same side, uh, the American side, the Allied forces were killed, 450. On the day after the first practice assaults, early on the morning of the 28th of April, the exercise was blighted when convoy T4, consisting of eight LSTs, carrying vehicles and combat engineers of the 1st Engineer Brigade, they were attacked by German E-boats in Lime Bay, which is probably about, as the crow flies, 40 to 50 miles further to the east of this location. Nine German E-boats had left Cherbourg shortly after midnight, avoiding the British MTBs, watching the port area and the English Channel. And then there was a flotilla, uh, six E-boats and the S uh, boot flotilla, commanded by uh, Sir Covenant Captain Bernd Klug. He saw eight ships and split into three pairs to attack with torpedoes. First ROT 3, then ROT 2, under Uppeter Lieutenant Zer C. Gutsteck. The final three E boats of the nine, S Boot Flotilla, commanded by Kurt van Captain Gutzer Feuer van Berkman, saw the red flares for attack. After with the battle Rotterpair, they collided and damaged its superstructure. The boats decided to leave, masking their retreat with smoke while sending another contract report. Now the attack was uh, reported further up the chain to both Erwin Rommel and Dwight D. Eisenhower. And they were enraged that the uh, our ships, the Allied Forces ships, were not zigzagging, um, which is what they had been instructed to do. They were going in a straight line, which made it a lot more vulnerable for them to be attacked. And that 10 American officers with knowledge of the invasion were, had gone missing. The missing officer had a bigot level clearance for D-Day. In other words, they had the highest level for knowing what was happening with the D-Day landings and the preparation here at Slapton Sands. And they knew the men and they could have compromised the invasion should they have been captured alive. As a result, the invasion was nearly called off because of the disaster in Lime Bay. And the bodies of all 10 victims were later found. He ordered that all the officers' bodies, any incriminating papers that they might have found, be completely destroyed. The 10 American officers were from the 1st Engineer Special Brigade, and they knew when and where the Utah and Omar landings were to take place at, uh, for D-Day. Now, following the reports that the S-boats were missing, uh, nosing through the wreckage for information with searchlights or torches, the shore batteries around nearby Sulcombe Harbour, which is about six, seven miles over in that direction to the west of here, have visually spotted unidentified small craft. But they were ordered not to fire on them, as it would have shown the Germans that the harbour was defended, and the disclosed that would have disclosed the battery position. As a result of an official embarrassment and concerns over potential leaks, just prior to the invasion, all the survivors were sworn to secrecy. Now this is why there was no real knowledge of what happened here until Ken Small started to investigate. Uh, it wasn't a direct cover-up as such, but because of what happened uh, with the 10 officers and the fact they had detailed knowledge of the D-Day landings, that was covered up and it led to the rest of the episode to be completely silent. Now as a result of Exercise Tiger, lessons were learned in terms of uh, mil military strategy and these were the radio frequencies were standardised, the British escort vessels were late and were out of position due to radio problems and a signal about the E-boat's presence was not pick up, picked up by the LSTs. Better life vest training was provided for landing troops and plans were made for small craft to pick up floating survivors on D-Day. So because of what happened here and the disaster of the, the, all the troops that were killed, lessons was uh, learned and it did mean that changes were made uh, before the D-Day landings actually happened on the Normandy beaches. Official histories, for reasons we, we've just said, they contain very little explanation about what happened here at Slapton Sands. Some commentators have called it a cover-up, but as I say, in reality, because of those 10 officers and all of the knowledge they knew about D-Day, a lot was done to protect the information from getting out. And that obviously fell down through the decades until it was started to be uncovered uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, the real truth, what, what actually happened here. The 
casualty statistics for Tiger, well, Exercise Tiger, were not released until August 1944, along with the casualties of the actual D-Day landings. The report stated that 442 army were dead and 997 navy for a total of 639. However, there were actually 749 dead. Um, so there was an un a significant under-reporting of uh, the, the troops and lives that, that, that were lost here. As we said, we have uh, Ken Small to thank for the uh, memorial at the Sherman Tank. I'm actually at the uh, car park here where there is another memorial. We'll, we'll go and have a look at that uh, one shortly. Uh, 1974, Ken Small bought from the US government the rights to the sub submerged tank, so it's down to him that, uh, that it is now in its location, rifle location there. Uh, and in 1984, with the aid of local residents and diving firms, he raised it which now stands in memorial to, to the incident. Uh, and there's obviously a plinth uh, that's been put on there. And the plaque was uh, done in 1995. And in 1997, there was the Exercise Tiger Memorial Association established a memorial to Exercise Tiger Veterans in Mexico, Missouri. Now, while I'm still here on the beach, I'd just hold, like to hold a little bit of silence to commemorate the lives that was lost. It was 1,100 in total, so we have the uh, the 449 from the uh, the friendly fire incident and also the 740 odd that died because of the German U-boats and the Lime Bay incident and uh, so I'd just like to have a little bit of a moment on the vlog here to commemorate those lives that were lost at this location here at Slapton Sands. Thank you. And now we'll have a look at the memorial on the uh, at the other end. Of, well, it's actually about the middle part of the beach here. And here we are at the memorial. And just read what it says. This memorial was presented by the United States Army authorities to the people of the South Hams, who generously left their homes and their lands to provide a battle practice area for the successful assault in Normandy in June 1944. Their action resulted in the saving of many hundreds of lives and contributed in no small measure to the success of the operation. The area included the villages Black Alton, Chillington, East Allington, Sherford, Slapton, Stokenham, Street and Torgrass, together with the many outlying farms and houses. In actual fact it was uh, some 3,000 residents that were evacuated here uh, before the uh, exercise tiger took place. Now this is where I left you last time at Slapton Lay, just at the uh, explanatory hut behind me. So what we're going to do now is to continue on a walk around the lay and uh, we'll see if we can see what bits of uh, nature we can see today and uh, also and see if I can find any remains of Slapton Castle. Now don't get too excited, it's not as exciting as Kingswear or Kingsbridge or Berry Pomeroy, other ones that I've covered or are going to cover. Um, it's an Iron Age fort, um, and so there's, there's an earthwork banking there, and I think it's further on this walk, so we'll see what we can see uh, further on. And uh, the other thing to tell you, following on from the first vlog on Slapton, just a um, bit of additional information really. Um, as you saw the abandoned tower that uh, essentially King Henry VIII had closed down, um, and I was a bit confused why there was a, what appeared to be a church tower only about 100 or 200 miles away from a church and there was only about 50 years apart in the 1300s between the two of them. Um, now the reason for that, I've uh, since done some further research, is because that it was not built as a church for the local populace to, to pray and worship in, but to, um, to teach um, priests. It was an ecclesiastical college, so that was the uh, the reason for that. I uh, hope that clarifies it. Now we're here back at the uh, the boardwalk, and the path 
continues this way. And unfortunately it is still quite breezy. I was hoping it was going to be a little uh, calmer filming here today, but uh, alas not. Uh, can't always choose what the weather's going to be. For the moment it is dry. I brought my uh, waterproof jacket with me just in case because it was uh, raining a bit uh, earlier on this morning. Um, it's Friday, Friday morning, and uh, it is, I believe, the 12th of March. I have to see the little uh, it is the waves as the uh, water loads them up. Obviously it's not a tidal current because this is a freshwater lake. As we said, it's the biggest freshwater lake in uh, well, the whole of West Country, Devon, Cornwall, Somerset. It's a lovely seat that the trusts of Slapton Lay have placed here. Very strategic because it has a wonderful view. I see somebody's decided to have a cup of tea here and unfortunately left their uh, cup behind on the end of the bench. Now I've just discovered this little oddity, um, so this is on the opposite side of the lake to the, the beach side, um, but I'm just wondering whether it has any connections to the story I was telling you earlier on with regards to Exercise Tiger. It does look indeed like it could be something to have been to do with the uh, Second World War, but I've got no way of substantiating that. Um, obviously you can see the, uh, the metal pieces of wire supporting the concrete and then it's like it says danger keep off it does look uh, very very precarious at the moment but uh, as I say I'm not sure whether that's second world war related or not it could well be as I said that uh, the American troops did choose this location because of the uh, the lay behind the beach which uh, uh, duplicated uh, the, the um, habitats that they would be experiencing on the D-Day landings in Normandy so they may well have put uh, fortifications around the lay as well but I don't know 100% um, whether that is the case. Now my geology teacher would probably shoot me for not remembering what geological feature this is. Um, obviously we have uh, tilted the rock plane is at a 45 degree angle protruding through where the footpath is here. As to what type of rock it is I'm not entirely certain. Um, if anybody knows please drop a comment in. But obviously like I pointed out earlier on uh, when we were looking at the beach end this is a fascinating place for geologists and geomorphologists um, in terms of the rock exposures and how it uh, literally looks like a book in terms of timelines of uh, how the rock was formed and twisted and cut through ice ages and um, erosion. Now I love this feature here that's been uh, placed, um, particularly the carvings on side. Um, it was the field studies Council in English Nature, but we have these wonderful, um, it's like bas relief uh, tableau all the way around this viewing platform. Uh, we have ducks here amongst the reeds, ducklings, could be a wren there. Dragonfly, possibly a sandpiper. And this side is clearly demonstrating the geological history from fossils. So we have some kind of dinosaur that I can't make out of this. And fossil remains here. And prehistoric fish. Yeah, so whoever came up with that, excellent. 11 out of 10, brilliant. Love it. So we're looking across the western side of the uh, River Lay. Um, there, are, there is another bird viewing platform just at the far end of that promontory there, just in between the trees. 
Uh, an actual fact, there, there is another bird hide when we go over to look at the bee sand, uh, bee sands uh, uh, lay. Uh, obviously it's not as big as this one, but uh, it's still well worth seeing. I love the base of some of the trees here. Noticed an, uh, three or four uh, sets of these uh, stone uh, round features. Um, I would imagine they were to, to hold gates. In fact, I can see bits of a hinge there on the left one. Um, th this is obviously predating Second World War activity and I would imagine denotes uh, boundary markers for different sections of the uh, this Slapton estate. Now I do like this, it's been kept uh, completely free for, as a sanctuary zone so it's not uh, generally open to the public unless um, with a visitor from the uh, Field Study Council Centre. Uh, looks like they've been doing some coppicing activity recently uh, to provide um, the, the well, clearance from invasive plants and also to improve the habitat for the wildlife. Now this is uh, called the Island Bay bird hide. One thing to know which links in with our story earlier as you can see from the tableau here is that uh, between the trees, I can't quite see it from here, but on the uh, it's marked on here, there was a farm called Ireland Farm, hence presumably the name. I'm not quite sure how I got the name, where the Irish connection comes in. Um, but that was abandoned uh, during Operation Tiger, so they would have been notified by the authorities, the people that uh, farmed hereabouts, living in that farm, and would have been told they need to move on. And clearly, after the uh, Second World War, they never moved back. So therein lies a bit of a sad family tale. Now, the farm would have been just behind those trees and uh, reed beds. There is actually a little bridge, causeway bridge over there as well, but uh, you can't actually see that from this location. It might be that we can gain some height shortly and look down upon this location to see, uh, to get a better view. We now heading back inland towards the, the village centre. Uh, so we're heading away from Slapton Lane now. But we're not done with the nature trail just yet. We have another boardwalk here, which takes us over the stream across the valley floor. Um, and Slapton Village is just, uh, it's about a quarter of a mile just uh, ahead of us on the other side of the, uh, the valley. Very calming flow of water coming through there. As you can see for here from the trees behind me, it is quite, uh, still quite blowy. I hope it's not too distracting. I am, I am actually talking very close to the microphone, so hopefully it, uh, you can hear me okay. But uh, I was hoping for a calmer day today, but uh, sadly not to be, just one of those things. Apologize for the wind noise here. So we've come up onto a promontory above Slapton village. Over there you should be able to see something recognisable from vlog number one. I don't need to explain any more about that. Um, but I've just seen this. Let's go and have a look. It's clearly nothing to do with the castle. It looks like it was a farm building. Um, whether it was again abandoned due to everything that happened with the Exercise Tiger, not too sure. The same lake as the one we discovered at the very beginning of vlog number one. Um, this place continues to uh, surprise and amaze me. There also looks like another little uh, small woodland orchard area which is recently planted so um, it looks like I will have to come back to explore further. Well apologies for doing the last piece of to camera inside my car. 
Um, I got back to the village of Slapton uh, where we last you saw me uh, buy that, uh, well I presume it's a ruined farmhouse and the heavens just opened so I had to put my camera equipment away, couldn't do any more pieces to camera on the last stretch I'm afraid. Uh, also I couldn't find any remains of Slapton Castle. Um, I think there's a field further up but there doesn't appear to be any public access uh, to get up to it so, uh, to enable to me to explore any further so I'm sorry guys and girls I drew a bit of a blank on that one but uh, if anybody does know anything more about Slapton Castle there is I think there's a Wikipedia page on it um, with a bit of a vague photograph but uh, I can't find like an aerial plan of how the earthworks were originally laid out just I'm not sure if it's ever been excavated or explored to to that uh, extent at all uh, so yes, uh, I'm here actually back at the Sherman Tank. I've just uh, done a shot which will be the thumbnail for the for the YouTube video when it uh, goes up the next few days. So what have we got coming up? Um, we have got the next video will probably be, I'm not 100% certain yet, depends on the weather and how I'm feeling everything, there will be a little bit evening explore around Dartmouth. Yeah, I said I'd explore Dartmouth again. Obviously the first video only really scratched the surface. It's got a fascinating history. So I'll see what other bits of snippets I can uh, uh, uncover about Dartmouth. Um, we'll go on a little evening explore as we've got the, uh, the lighter evenings now. Uh, could do a little bit of an explore around that uh, town again which is obviously pretty close to where I live because obviously we're still currently in lockdown. Uh, also coming up I'm going to be exploring Cornworthy and Tuckinghay. Tuckinghay is where uh, the former, the late uh, TV chef uh, Keith Floyd had his uh, restaurant, the pub there, uh, the Monsters Arms I think it's called, uh, off the top of my head. Um, beautiful location, uh, perhaps we'll explore that and the old, uh, I think it was a paper mill in Tuckinghay as well. That's a fantastic uh, building and a beautiful clock Perhaps we'll go and have a look at that as well. So lots coming up. Uh, be, as we come out of lockdown, then I'll be exploring further afield outside of the immediate area I live. Uh, we'll be going into uh, Cornwall. Uh, one of the places I uh, spoke uh, on my Twitter account to somebody that follows me on there. Um, one of the places I'd like to do in Cornwall will be the Tamor Valley around uh, the National Trust Cateel site. So look out for that coming up soon. Anyway, hope you're all okay. Uh, give it a thumbs up, a like, a share if uh, that's what you feel you want to do. Subscribe and then you'll be press the bell icon and then YouTube will alert you when the next one comes up. Okay, thanks very much for sharing your time with me today and look forward to see you all again too. Cheers now. Bye.